Wow, thank you. Doesn't Jay and Dee do an amazing job here? I've only been here for an hour or so and I can just see their hearts so clearly here for the Lord and what an amazing community um, you guys have. Just hearing all the list of, of like things that you're doing during the week, that's amazing. That's great. And um, it's such a blessing for us to be here because we're from Warren Ponds Community Church, which is a bit bigger of a church, and we haven't actually yet come back face-to-face. So to be here face-to-face with God's people, no masks even. I mean, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so today Hebrews 9, it's on uh, pure worship, which... um, Hebrews is actually one of my favourite books in the Bible and and in particular Hebrews 9 is just a a really beautiful chapter that highlights so many contrasts. Oh, sorry, fiddling with the equipment. So we see lots of contrasts between, um, you know, there's lots of rituals and lots of versus kind of um, the relationship with Jesus. It really highlights, oh, thank you, I'm a bit of a wanderer. You know, it really contrasts between the worship under the old covenant and the worship of under the new covenant, covenant which we have um, through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we, in the first half of Hebrews, we're really thrusted into the Old Testament world. So we see things in, in the scripture, um, words like sanctuary and sacrifices and washings and they're all things that aren't really vocab or or language that we associate with our worship experience. Um, But again, we're going to enter into that kind of Jewish Jewish culture and really examine what they consider to be pure worship. Okay, and if I can just bring up, now do I have to do the slides? Okay, go to the first slide. So where these scriptures are set um, through a, a tent called the tabernacle. Okay, so the tabernacle, as you can see up, up on the screen, you guys, yep, cool, okay. So you can see it's literally a tent. It was a tent that was movable. It, it moved around with the Israelites, okay, as they wandered through the wilderness. And it came about because in Exodus, um, God commanded Moses to build the tabernacle. And it was to be a reminder of his presence. Um, with his people at all times. Um, And it was actually set up in the middle of the Israelite camp. And um, you can't really see in this picture, but they would have had all their tents set up right around up to the hills, and they all faced in towards the tabernacle. So they were all facing God, okay? So that's the scene. That's where we're at before we enter into this scripture. Um, I guess the beautiful thing was that the Lord wanted his people to know that he was with them. You know, he said in um, Exodus 25, 8, let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. And this is the sanctuary. So as they moved around, as they kind of faced the, the heat of the desert, they knew that God also faced that heat. As they faced their trials and their struggles, they felt like God was with them through this tent. Okay. Um, Now, chapter 9, we've got two sections. The first section, up to verse 10, is all about um, the worship under the Old Covenant, and then we move into the New Covenant under under Jesus. So let's go to verse 1. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room was a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. Sometimes it's also known as the holy of holies. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark were a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's stave that sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim, or divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot, cannot explain these things in detail now. Now that tells me that there was so much more, you know, little little knickknacks and gold bits and pieces that were there that symbolised things to them, but 
That's not the important part of this story. If we can just go, ah, oh, Jesus, you're good. It's done. So this is the inner ta tabernacle. So we can see here this section. You come in the gate. The everyday people would come in the gate. And they'd come to the altar of burnt offerings. And that's where they would bring their offering of sacrifice. That's where they would sacrifice their animals. And then they'd move over to the bronze basin, and that's where they'd wash up after the sacrifice. Now that is as far as the everyday people got. They weren't permitted to go any closer into the tent. So that's, that was their interaction with God personally there, right? So then if you're a priest, you were allowed to go into this first section right here, into the holy place. And you can see there that they had the lampstand, and the lampstand was a bit like a, a, a um, candelabra with lots of, of candles lit at all times, and that was really to represent that um, God was their light. He was illuminating their way for them, okay? Um, they had the table of the presence, and that always had 12 loaves of bread on it, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Now, if you were the, the high priest, you were the only person allowed into the Holy of Holies, into the Ark of the Covenant. And that was considered to be where the heart of God dwelled. So there's only one person allowed to interact with God on that immediate level. Now, what um, I just wanted to draw your attention to the curtain that was there between the, the holy place and the holy of holies. We come to know that later on as the veil. Okay, so in Jerusalem, when they build the temple, that becomes and they replicate this, that becomes the veil. And where do we know the veil from? That's the veil ripping. The veil ripping, of course. Yeah, definitely. So when the curtain is torn in two, to symbolise that the new covenant is coming into place. Okay, we'll go to verse 6. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. So this is really referring to the daily rituals, the daily practices of worship, where the priests came in. Oh, I don't have the picture anymore, but it doesn't matter. So the priests came in and they made sure that there was oil in the lamps and they made sure that the loaves of bread were on the table and they... They'd oversee the sacrifices and they'd, they'd make sure the animals were cut up in, in the, the very precise and pure ways. This was their daily worship, okay? Um, when we move into um, verse 7, we start to hear about their yearly rituals of worship. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people, the sins the people had committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented was still in place. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. Now you've got to remember that Hebrews was written as a letter. Okay, and Hebrews 9 was particularly important because it, it came at a time when the, the Jewish culture was really shifted. Okay, there were some believers of Jesus, and there were some people who believed in Jesus, but they still wanted to practice the old ways of worship. Okay, so worship was really divided at that time. And so Hebrews, in particular chapter 9, was really important really important to say, hey, we don't have to live sacrificing animals anymore, okay, to cover your sin. We're under a new covenant now, which we're, we're going to find out a bit more about. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, Physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. The really important word here is conscience. Did you know that the word conscience is featured more times in Hebrews than anywhere else in the Bible? It means something. It means something. 
what it's saying is that despite the tabernacle's golden splendour, despite all its magnificence and glory, and despite all the rituals and the washings and the cleansings, despite all the food, it still didn't cleanse the conscience. It was viewed as worldly in verse 1. It's described as worldly. Built by man. And only had, gave limited access to God, which made it ineffective for what it needed to do. Okay? And, and what it needed to do was for God's heart to be changed from the inside out. For their... For the Old Testament sacrifices, they were just a covering, okay? They did not offer forgiveness or cleansing of their consciences. Reminds me a bit about, um, we've moved this year into a bigger family home. We've got three boys that kind of all primary school age. And, you know, it's madness most days in our house. It's just mad. And we live in this beautiful little place today. Oh, my gosh, it's tiny. Anyway... For some reason, some reason, who have built this place? They put carpet in the dining room. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now we have we raised our boys as babies right up through, wing them onto solids, and you know, they're food loving, throwing, you know, the works. Well, you should have seen the stains on the table. It was embarrassing. So embarrassing. And, you know, I think at some point what we probably did was lift up a carpet, pick, a, pick up a rug, I mean, and put over the stains. Because, you know, you can't see it. You can't see it. But the stain remains underneath. It re remained underneath. And so this reminds me a bit about these, these, this scripture here. The types of rituals in the Old Covenant kind of represents how you can pick up a rug and try and hide the stains. And it looks like it's gone externally. It looks like it's gone, but it's not. It's still there. The blood of the animals seemed to make sin look invisible, but it didn't change their hearts. Food and drink and material things, they have no power. They might be external and visual, but they have no power to cleanse the internal no power to cleanse the soul, no power to change the heart. Ritual is simply not adequate. And, you know, they killed so many animals trying. I mean, I think they called them, um, there was so much, sorry, I'm talking about blood so much in this sermon, right? But they killed so many animals that they called it the river of blood, I think, next to where the basin was. It's just a constant flow of blood. But no matter how many lambs and goats they sacrifice, in verse 8, it just acknowledges that the worship practice was shallow and temporary. It was only until a new and better and permanent system came into place. So from here we start to see contrast in the scripture between the earthly covenant in the tabernacle and the heavenly covenant brought through the shedding of Jesus' blood. Verse 11. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all and secured our redemption forever. That's our truth, isn't it? Jesus is our tent. He is our human tabernacle. He is the new high priest who, who removes all that limit, limitations and access. And, you know, we can, we now under the new covenant can have that access to God, not just once a year, but for eternity. Verse 13. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremony impurity. 
Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. This is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and his people, so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if you are saved, you are saved by the blood of Jesus. That you have eternal redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ that you have access to the Heavenly Father like the people in the Old Covenant never did. It tells us that Jesus Christ's blood cleanses your conscience and we, instru- uh, and we are instructed to worship, worship him with praise and thanks for this. Then in the scripture, it kind of gets a bit more legalistic. We'll go into her verse 16. Now, when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of the calves and goats along with water, and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop, might say, might be saying that wrong, branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, the blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. They're powerful words, aren't they? Sin is costly. Blood is required in payment. The effect doesn't kick in until after we die, really. But what's the promise? Eternal life. If Jesus' blood is covering you, If you are trusting in him, serving him, worshipping him, you will have eternal life. That is our promise. I asked my boys yesterday, I I said, what do you think of when you hear the word blood? You can probably imagine the array of responses I got from primary school boys. It's something like, oh, I think about when, like, I cut my head off or something like that. And I was like, oh. Godly, you know. The other two came up with, oh, generally it happens because there's been an accident, which says to me that we often associate blood with brokenness. I often think about that, that statement that you say, um, oh, you don't want the, the blood on your hands. Guilt. And then the other thing that I associate blood with generally is stain. Let me tell you a story. I came home with my new wedding dress and I thought I'm going to sh- try it on and show my sister-in-law. A beautiful white satin skirt, so pure, so beautiful. I felt like royalty wearing it. And I put it on in this moment of glory and then I looked down and there's droplets of bright, bright red blood going down the front and I'm like, what has happened? Somehow I've got this random cut finger in trying on my wedding dress. The fear of the stain set us into a flurry, let me tell you. My, my sister-in-law just worked away at it, worked away, worked away, and she told me something that day. She said, if you let the blood, if you let the protein in the blood set, that's when it stains. And we got it out because she just stabbed away instantly on it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> 
that says to me, it kind of speaks to me, it tells me that if we leave things, if we are ignorant about sin, if we're ignorant about about the effect it's having on our life, it can stay and it stays. But if we work on it, we work through it, we can become more free. And so we often associate, what did I say? Guilt, stain, brokenness with blood. But here we're hearing in the scripture. We're actually hearing, it's another contrast, we're hearing about the positive impact of blood, the power that blood can have for good, okay? And what I think is really cool is that God says, hey, your sins, but I'm not going to make you shed your blood. I'm going to shed mine for you. That's pretty. You don't hear that in the world these days, do you? That's amazing. Verse 24, midway through, he as in Jesus, entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again and again ever since the world began. But now, once and for all, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Praise the Lord. I'm doing some study at the moment, um, some theology studies, and I guess one of the really nice things is that I get to read um, lots of theologians' perspectives about God and and, um, just see, like, through the the times, the different interpretations and and recently I did this big research assignment and I discovered Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Has anyone, anyone heard of him before? Yeah, he was a great um, German um, pastor, Lutheran pastor, and he was anti-Nazi, basically. And Hitler, uh, well, he threw him into Auschwitz. He considered him a threat enough to, to put him into a concentration camp. And before Hitler actually died, he made sure that he killed Bonhoeffer first. Okay, so that says to me so much about the, the power and influence that he could have had sharing the truth about God. But one of the beautiful things that I think he articulated was that all forgiveness requires suffering. When you think about in your life, if, if you're someone who's had to experience evil at the hand of someone else, to forgive them, it requires suffering. It's painful to work through it. This principle is true of God too. When he chose to forgive our sin, it was costly for him. Without Jesus' blood, we will die. That is the issue here. That is the issue. The only thing that affects your eternal status is the blood of Jesus. He died to save you. He shed his blood for God to forgive you. If that doesn't start to change your heart, you might have to have a think about how you know Jesus or how you understand Jesus. I get it. It's really hard to really kind of deep down in your heart and all the fibres of your body to really understand that kind of love, that that depth of sacrifice. I I really struggle with it sometimes. I really struggle with it because on on the earth, you just don't really see that kind of depth, do you, in love? I recently was watching something and they explained a... I thought kind of a good analogy of how 
It's kind of like the love of Jesus. It's kind of like as if you're walking through a big, long train tunnel. Okay, it's really long. Once you start walking through it, you can't just run back, you know, so you're going through it and you're walking with a friend alongside you and it's just the train tracks and, and the tunnel around you. And you are midway through and you, and you realise in a great panic that there's a train coming through the tunnel, okay? There's no way, you can't run fast enough to outrun it, you can't run back, you've got to face the train that is coming. Basically, you face death in that moment. And on the side of the track, there's only enough room. There's only enough room for one person to stand on the side. And you can imagine, you know, on this earth, what the kerfuffle that could come about from the two people trying to fight for their own survival. But in this scenario, in this scenario, the two people are in the middle of the tracks and one of them pushes the other side aside as the train gets closer and closer, pushes them aside, out of the way protects them, saves them, whilst the other takes death in their place. Takes death so that they can live. I thought that was kind of, yeah, I can start to understand the sacrifice in that way. That love, that love where the, the person thinks of the other person first. How do we respond to this? How do we respond to this love, this sacrifice, the covering of Jesus' blood? If it was your friend who offered up their life for you, you would feel indebted for the rest of your life. You would thank them daily for being able to live. You would be elevated to a whole nother level of gratitude than just the everydayness, the everyday thanks. Our Christian attitude must reflect this too. Praise and worship must become a part of our daily life. How we worship indicates the depth of our gratitude. It shows our understanding of that sacrifice. We have to be careful, though, because we can come before it from the wrong place. We can, we can come into ritual as well, even as Christians. You think about coming into church sometimes, you know, we've probably all done it. We've come in and we just roll with the motions. You know, your worship song starts playing and internally we kind of go, oh, not this song again. <laughs> oh, don't like this song. During communion, instead of kind of placing your heart before the Lord, you might think, oh, how long is this going to go for? What's the lunch? Oh, how can I might? Got some ham in the fridge. Might make a toasted sandwich. We can do it all without examining our hearts. We can do all that without surrendering every day before the Lord. We can tip into ritual, the earthly shoulds, the earthly limitations and corruptions. None of it gets done what needs to be done. They will not cleanse our conscience and they will not bring glory to the Lord for his sacrifice and they will not give us eternal life. You know, in the ancient world, God tore the veil in half upon the death of Jesus and do you know what the leaders did? Does anyone know what they did when the veil tore? When the, the new covenant came into, into action? The leaders actually sewed it up. They said, no, we don't want Jesus. We want our rituals. We want to light our candles. We want to do as we always have. Their hearts were hard. They weren't going to budge. They weren't going to worship Jesus. They were just going to worship what was. So are you dividing your worship between what is and what was? Scripture says believing and worshipping Jesus wholeheartedly is our calling. 
And in verse 14, it says, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice to sin. And I think that's such a beautiful demonstration of servanthood, isn't it? It really should empower us to think about how we serve as an offering of gratitude. If you allow the blood of Jesus to take a grip of your heart, you will serve in ways that you didn't think was possible. I mean, 10 years ago, would I have said, oh, I'm going to be um, preaching at Ararat Community Church? I, no, I wasn't even going to church 10 years ago. I wouldn't have thought I was, would be studying a Masters of Divinity. Like, it's crazy what God will do if you just say, okay, be worried, but I will step out with you bit by bit. And he will put the next step. He won't give it all to you all at once, right? That just freaks anyone out. He will give you step by step. And as an act of gratitude and our worship for what Christ did, we'll say, I'm willing. I'm willing. Jesus went to the cross for us and in payment we can worship and serve him with a heart of gratitude because there is nothing like the blood of Jesus. You want to come up and do some quickly? And I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for us because... In the old covenant, the people were separated by a veil, the curtain. We have full access. Full access. That gives us so much more power than often what we think. Okay. Let's make it our goal this week as we move into our week to find new ways to worship Jesus for his sacrifice. You know, if it's as simple as singing as loudly as we can in worship, so be it. If it's just saying, I instead of watching Netflix for the next half an hour, I'm going to open the Word, so be it. If it's saying, um, I might go and get a piece of chocolate out of the pantry right now, I'm just going to stand here for one minute and say, thank you for your provision, Lord. Thank you that you died so that I can live sin free under the covering of Jesus' blood. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to kill animals. I don't have to, nothing. I just have to believe, have an open heart and praise him. I mean, we've got actually the easiest deal, haven't we? In the, under the new covenant, it is simple. It is basic. It is basic. And all it takes is a little bit of time, a whole lot of heart. But we will be empowered and we have the promise of an eternal life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That your glory no longer dwells in a, in a tent, but it dwells in our own hearts. Thank you for allowing your son to shed his blood. The final, the one and final sacrifice required for our sin. Make this be our motiva motivating factor in our life. Let it move our hearts. Oh, let it move our hearts in ways that we haven't experienced before. Oh, Lord, send us into new, new places, a new level of gratitude for you, Lord. Come on, this isn't the season to be insipid. This isn't the season. We've got work. We, we are representatives of, of the Lord. Lord, empower us. Make us be brave. Oh, Lord, 
Help us to start our day with just a little bit of worship for you to show our gratitude towards you. Help us to recognise our sins and when we need to come to you. Lord, maybe there's people here that don't know you yet and, and I just ask that this moves them. And maybe there's people here, Lord, that have been praising and serving you the same way that they always have. Lord, elevate them, Lord. They are capable, we know that, Lord, give them the faith that they can step into a new place with you because you shed your blood for them to do that. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord, and quit us, Lord. Open our hearts. Allow us to worship you in a deeper place, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Let's all um, thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Let's all stand and just show our gratitude towards the Lord right now. I think I've been roped into singing this song as well. foundations are good. The foundations are good. There is growth coming. There is growth coming. There is growth coming. Through the congregations, roots planted deeply on the foundations of Christ. Like the grapevines, that grow up the main street and are rooted deeply into the earth. So this church is rooted into this community. As those vines continue to grow and bear fruit, as this church continues to grow and bear fruit, this church will grow and will start to feed the hungry the spiritually barren community that's in need, that is desolate, that is desolate. They will see this light shining that permeates from within us. It's God's light that shines from the people that are firmly rooted in the foundations of this church. And as the generations grow, so too, well, God's word is yet throughout this community. Let's sing together. Come on.
sacrifice of ourselves to you this morning Lord we thank you that we've heard directly from you this morning Lord my prayer is that this week that message that's been spoken the words that have been delivered in this place this morning can you work at our hearts Lord Father work at our hearts so that they might have a transformative effect on us Lord Lord we are saved because we come to you Lord, we're saved by your blood, Lord. Lord, and we give you our lives, Lord. Lord, as we just seek to, to know you and to bring others to know you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wasn't that just amazing? What a talented 
anointed couple. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I just want to say, if God's spoken to you this morning, don't leave here without coming out and getting a prayer. Go and speak to Jay, speak to Vicky, anyone. Just go and speak to someone and tell them how God's spoken to you and get them to pray for you. If God wants you to take a step closer in your walk with him, don't leave here this morning without doing that. Make sure you get prayed for this morning. Make sure you commit the rest of your life to him in a way that he wants you to. It's hard to end. <laughs> it's really hard to finish. I can just feel God's anointing. It's just so strong. Thank you so much for ministering to us this morning. We do have tea and coffee out there this morning. We've got date scones. We've got apple slices. We've got cream. <laughs> so please don't leave without having a cup of tea or a coffee and some fellowship and something to eat. But most of all, don't leave without responding to God's call on their life this morning. Right. Thank you.